Right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this uh, Thursday afternoon. Um, just uh, before we start, just a few house rules. Um, if you have any questions that you would like us to answer, um, please just, uh, you'll see that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please just type them in there and then we will um, try and answer as many of your questions as possible um, at the end of the talk. Uh, the talk's going to be roughly between 20 and 30 minutes. After that, we'll try and, uh, try and answer everybody's questions um, if, if at all possible. All right. Um, so just a bit of background. Today's talk is about conservation and tourism. It's a, it's a, and, and we call it a match made in heaven with a question mark. Um, we're going to discuss it a little bit today. We're going to give you a perspective from, from the Endangered Wildlife Trust side and then from uh, Graham Edmund from uh, the AHA Hotels and Lodges will also share his point of view um, on, on conservation and tourism. So just to start off, um, we're going to just chat a little bit about the Endangered Wildlife Trust and the angle that we are coming from. Um, for us, our vision is a healthy planet and a equitable world that values and sustains and the diversity of all life. Um, and then the mission of the EWT is we dedicated to conserving threatened species and ecosystems and Eastern Southern Africa to benefit the benefit of all people. We'll also get to the pillars of the EWT just now, which will sort of emphasize what I'm speaking about now. And the purpose of the EWT and sort of our slogan is protecting forever together. Um, and that's, that's, and there's our website as well for those of you that have never been, um, www.ewt.org.za. So just looking at a few of the pillars of the EWT, um, our focus is mostly on saving species. Then secondly, on saving habitats and then benefiting all people with the support of um, the legal framework side of things as well. So those are the three main pillars of the EWT, saving species, saving habitats and benefiting people. And um, we also focus a lot on some of the other cross cutting approaches like our skills and capacity building and development, um, our partnerships and collaboration, which is one of the things we're talking about today. And then some innovation and horizon scanning as well, robust science. Um, we've got a whole conservation science unit at the EWT, um, and then population health and the environment, the PHE side of things, and social development, mainstreaming um, biodiversity into business, and then um, also advocacy and the African range expansion. Just to give you guys a bit of idea, 116 staff, 12 countries, 44 vehicles, eight offices across Africa. So the EWT stretches far and wide. Um, but as you will see now later, this sort of coincides a lot with where where a, a company like AHA has got, uh, got some of their um, assets. Just to look at some of the, the programs that the EWT are involved in, um, as you can see a, a vulture on the screen over there, we've, uh, we're protecting vultures in, in, uh, across Africa. Um, to, uh, obviously, vultures play a very important role in the ecosystem, and uh, it's, a, it's a, very part, a very big part of uh, you know, maintaining a healthy ecosystem across Africa. Um, and then we also work on, on some of the larger eagle species like Marshall eagles, for example, over here. Um, and then, as I said earlier, we, we, we also protect a lot of habitats across the WT, also own some properties up in Stoutbonsberg and Limpopo province. So those are some of the, the areas that we really focus on. And these habitats are, of course, critical for these species that we're speaking about to maintain them. Um, a lot of the, the operations of AHA and a lot of the areas where they work in and have lodges and operations also coincide with protecting habitats like on communities and school kids and education programs. Once again, a, a very nice synergy with, uh, with some, of the, some of the activities that, that the lodges uh, in and around protected areas also do. Skills development, like mentioned earlier, is critically important. Uh, the lady in picture here is, is, is part of a a, a group of uh, ladies uh, working at Siri Wind Farm in the in the Western Cape, stroke Northern Cape on the boundary up there. They uh, they, they they started off um, and now all have qualifications around um, you know uh, for Gaza etc. To to really and, and they know species and, and all the habitat in that area now almost by by name. So yeah, it's really been a really big success story, and we focus a lot on on uh, development and skills development and skills transfer between uh, staff members and externally and internally as well. Um, 
Then just going, taking a step back to species quickly, some of the, the major species that, uh, that, that create synergy between AHA and EWT, species like rhino, critically important to try and protect these guys all over, all over Africa to try and uh, still show them to guests when they come over. Um, some of our dogs, our canine project at the EWT, who works a lot on, um, at the airports and uh, the sniffer dogs uh, and all the cargo at the airports, looking at uh, all the um, illegal wildlife trade. And uh, we've, we've got quite a few dogs trained up. They work extensively at these airports. And the game reserve, then also looking at supporting some of the rangers on the ground. We, we patrol these protected areas and keep these animals and habitats secure for all of us. And then just a particular focus on two sections um, of, of the, the partnership where it really, really started. Um, a while back, uh, Makalali Game Reserve, which is one of the or Makalali Lodge, which is one of the, the areas where um, where AHA has has operations, wanted to relocate wild dogs um, onto the property. And that's sort of where a lot of the, the synergy and the partnership started between EWT and AHA. And there's a nice picture of a, of a pack of wild dogs uh, running into the sunset. Um, now, just to look at some of the critically important things and, and some of the the, the, the pillars that the partnership is based on. If you look at wild dogs, in, wild dogs are extinct in 25 of the 39 countries across Africa. It's critically important that a picture like this, a wild dog with a collar being released onto a new reserve and part of our wild dog meta population project. And, and also then obviously giving tourists the opportunity to see these critically endangered, the most critically endangered carnivore in, in, uh, in South Africa, um, to give tourists the opportunity to see this at, at lodges and and operations is, is, is very important for a partnership like ours. Then Cheetah is, a, is another prime, prime example of one of the pillars of the, the partnership, um, the Cheetah Meta Population Project, which the EWT works on. You can see there how it's escalated over the years and Cheetah in, in, and there's some of the meta population reserves that have increased over the years. And Cheetah populations all over globally, uh, Cheetah populations have plummeted all over the place. The population is also not very good news at the moment. You can see South Africa is the only area where cheetah populations are going up. Um, so, and, and, and reserves and um, habitat protection um, with companies like the Ho, who own properties and who have to maintain properties, etc. Critically important for the EWT from our side to try and make sure that cheetahs are protected and relocated into reserves like this all over the place. Sites like this is, 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 is both great from a from a conservation and a tourism point of view, this is what people want to come out and see in Africa. And this is what the, one of the things that WT also loves to see is this critically um, important work and, and to have cheetah cubs with a mother like this and populations growing and, you know, endangered species populations going up in, in South Africa is, is critically important from an EWT point of view. So now I'd just uh, like to hand over to, to Graham Edmund just to, just to walk us through um, how the tourism side of the house sees a partnership like this. Thanks, Constance. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I know you guys can't see us on video, but effectively that is Constant and myself, Constant on the left and myself on the right. It's a bit of background as to who we are as a whole hotels and lodges. So effectively a tourism property management company. We fall under a bigger tourism group called Tourvest, and we fall in the accommodation activities division within the, the Tourvest fold. We have properties across most of the provinces in South Africa, as well as um, outside of South Africa in Botswana and Zambia. So nine hotels and 16 lodges. These stats here are obviously pre-COVID, and um, this COVID pandemic has had a detrimental impact on the tourism industry. So all these stats just highlight the importance of Tourvest and it's I mean, of tourism when it is in full flow. So just to give you some stats, 1.5 million jobs, 4.5% of total employment. Um, South Africa did have a vision to increase jobs by 2 million by 2030 and double international arrivals. This will obviously um, change now with COVID. I thought a, a, a relevant quote from President Saul Ramaphosa, and I'll give you time to, to read it yourselves. But yeah, view tourism as our parents view gold, as the foundation of our country's prosperity. It's worth valuing and protecting. You can read the rest of that quote, but I think 
really relevant for tourism as well as conservation. So that 2030 vision, two slides back, effectively service destination management, which is the single biggest um, inbound operator in South, maybe Southern Africa. 90% of the total inbound tourists include a wildlife experience in their itineraries. So the major attraction for tourism to South Africa, or Southern Africa is wildlife. So our tourists experience wildlife through a variety of conserved wildlife areas, both private and public. So in order for us to continue to attract um, tourists, we need to conserve these wildlife areas. Um, there are a number of other issues, but if we don't conserve our wildlife areas, South Africa won't be as attractive as a destination. Areas we need to, how are we going to continue to offer wildlife conservation areas? Um, it needs to remain beneficial to key stakeholders, so private sector, communities, and government entities. Private sector, we can only benefit from tourism if the conservation areas continue to exist. So we need to ensure that the community see benefit in conserving these areas and the private sector needs to involve the communities in the surrounding, surrounding the reserves as a real shareholder. Communities, community involvement is key, otherwise the conservation areas won't exist. Without community involvement, the battle to keep these conserv conservation areas a viable option for the country will be lost. So I know the likes of Kruger, etc, they're starting to bring communities in in a, in a big way because those are the people who can really benefit from, from the wildlife and conservation areas. Then government entities. So government main focus is job growth and then participation in tourism economy through ownership in wildlife areas, which results in jobs and community upliftment. So earlier I mentioned the real shareholder. So communities, they need to share in the profits. They need to have some level of um, involvement in the decision making. Um, the existence of the conservation area affects their lives, so jobs, and jobs again. The livelihood of most of the communities around conservation areas depend on the lodge and the performance of the lodge. It's not just a front where a single person or a, a corporate benefits at the expense of the community. So I'll speak to the conservation areas, which I'm sure all of you are aware, but an expanding population, um, unemployment, and if the community doesn't have a vested interest, interest in the wildlife conservation area where they're based. It can obviously lead to illicit animal trade, poaching, or subsistence poaching just to survive. So two of our models which we've got in our, our whole portfolio is in Kambeni, which is inside the Kruger National Park, right by Numbi Gate. So we effectively rent the land from the community, so we pay the community to rent that land. In addition, we give um, a percentage of the turnover is paid to the community and 80% of the total staff complement needs to be employed directly from the community. We also sponsor the school there. We feed 650 kids a day, um, but those are just some other side that benefits the community. And once you're involved with them, you'll become more involved and there'll be more projects, more schools, more libraries, etc., to build. So that's one of the examples. And then Takoda River Camp, so it's community owned. We serviced the loan from the IDC, which um, effectively built the lodge on behalf of the community. We've been involved there for a while now, so we did have the similar 80% requirements of staff, but now um, one of the ladies who started as a ranger there, a lady called Patience, she worked her way up. She's now from the community and she's the general manager of Takoda River Camp. And 37 of the 38 jobs are effectively employed from the direct community. Our conservation partnership, myself and Constance started talking a couple of years ago and we wanted to see where we could make, make a difference and benefit us obviously as a corporate enterprise and benefit communities and benefit and keep the conservation areas um, sustainable. So effectively in the process of doing this, we started this in February, but effectively 1% of our total revenue will be donated to the EWT. The purpose is to conserve threatened species and ecosystems in Southern Africa. Our role as a whole is to generate tourists and create viable businesses in conservation areas and allow these to continue to thrive. And EWT to assist with conservation efforts to ensure the survival of the species and ecosystems that ultimately attract our tourists. Our EWT, we believe without conservation, we don't have a business. They're internationally renowned, so they focus on species, habitat, and people. It's exactly aligned to our strategy. They're ethical and accountable. 
value partnerships. Also very important, they have areas uh, or footprint in areas where are relevant to our business. And Tervis also has businesses in Tanzania and other places. So we as a whole are the, the guinea pigs. And should this be a successful partnership, which we have no doubt it will be, we'll roll that out across more properties in the Tervis group. So we believe we can create a long-standing meaningful relationship where we can actually make a difference to tourism and conservation. Thanks everybody. Um, just to, just to preempt a lot of the uh, questions, etc. I, th I think we're going to, we're going to try and uh, chat to you guys a little bit more about some of the other alignments um, in, in the partnership. Um, just if you if you look at the 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 AHA footprint versus the EWT footprint, as Graham mentioned, now towards the end of his presentation, we um, we are you know we we, we work in the very similar areas um, areas that like we mentioned is critical critical for both conservation and tourism and for communities around these properties. So we really try and um, we really try and align everything that we do as a partnership to invest in these areas and the people in these areas to try and ensure that we make it sustainable sustainable in the long run. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, um, we're gonna try and answer some of them now um, as, they, as they come through. Um, so we'll just hang on a sec, just to try and see whether we, we get any questions through from, from people. Right, just to give people the chance of, of, of questions to come through, we, we I, th I think a lot of, I've already had one or two questions um, that people sent and, and a lot of it is aimed around how do we see both conservation and um, tourism affected by, by the whole COVID pandemic. Um, you know, I think from a, from a co conservation perspective, it's still very early days for us to, to really say what the, what the real impact is. But I think if, if you just keep an eye on social media, etc., you'll see that there's a lot of um, noise being made around, uh, you know, poaching increasing definitely in protected areas. Um, I know both in provincial reserves and in um, other um, national parks, etc., we have seen a bit of an escalation in in some areas in poaching. So that's definitely one of the one of the areas where where we've seen it. Um, there's a question here from Carmela. Um, who are you, Grant? Now, Camilla, to answer your question, I mean, we're definitely open to work with other lodges in Limpopo. We've got quite a big footprint in Limpopo and in Pumalanga. So, certainly, I'm sure you can get my contact details from EWT, but yeah, I'm more than happy to work with multiple properties across Southern Africa. All right, the second question is from Frank Dinner. Uh, Frank's asking, obviously, COVID has a devastating effect on tourism at the moment. What are the plans post-COVID to encourage more South Africans to explore um, South Africa and become more involved in local projects? Um, I'll just answer it quickly from um, uh, EWT point of view, and then I'll hand over to Graham again. From, from an EWT point of view, um, you know, we, we really, if, if you have, have a look at our social media, et cetera, we really pushing quite hard for people to postpone and not cancel their trips. We're really pushing for people to try and help us, um, you know, to get tourists back into parks. We, we recognize it's critically important, you know, to fund anti-poaching projects um, and et cetera, for people to return to these tourism destinations as soon as possible. So um, from, a, from EWT side, we're really pushing hard to get that done. Yeah, and I think there's a big drive to try and get South Africans to explore their own country. I think if you look at the rest of the world, um, a number of people are traveling within their own countries. So South Africa should do the same. I mean, from an AHA perspective, we have issued some ridiculous res uh, South African residence prices across our full portfolio. Uh, we're just waiting on the announcement and more information on when domestic leisure tourism will be open. We've heard from the president that it's open, um, but we don't know if interprovincial is open yet. So 
Minister of Tourism should address us in the next few days to understand exactly how we can open. Um, because all we've opened so far is our city hotels for business travel. Then Alistair, your question on sand parks, northwest parks and is Mvelo are going to be very badly impacted by a lack of tourism. Do we operate in these reserves and would we consider doing so in the future? Um, Alistair, we operate two properties in, in, inside the Kruger, both community properties in Bluli and in Kambeni. And we offer, operate in Northwest Parks um, we, with Medikwe, as well as uh, Ivory Tree and Shepherd's Tree in the Pilansburg. Um, Isam Villa we don't operate in. Um, luckily, those parks still have got a lot of domestic leisure tourism. Um, international tourism, I think, for the remainder of 2020 is um, pretty much gone. So 2021s will be looking at for the future for tourism there. Um, but luckily, they have got some base business out of the domestic market. We've done some phenomenal packages with EWT where you can go on these experiential, experiential type um, packages with a maximum of eight people, where whatever is needed in that reserve at that specific point in time, you stayed on a whole property, an EWT specialist in that specific animal or field will come out with the group stay three to four nights depending on what the program is but effectively there we will donate to EWT and we effectively get the, the rooms revenue so there are lots of opportunities and different things we are trying to try and drive as much volume we can into sand parks and uh, northwest national parks All right, then from Jackie Scott, does EWT ever have concerns of the potentially negative impacts of tourism on wildlife um, and wild habitats, rose development, um, human disturbance undermines their ultimate goal of protecting nature? Okay, that's not, not an easy question, but um, yeah, we, we, do have, we do have great concerns around it, great concerns around it. I mean, we have a wildlife and roads project specifically aimed at looking at the impacts of of uh, you know roads in protected areas, and um, we also look at uh, we also have a wildlife and energy program which looks at all the power lines that runs into these protected areas. Um, you know, so we we really uh, you know focus a lot on on those kind of impacts that are happening inside um, inside especially inside protected areas, but also outside of protected areas. So yeah, it 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 is it does have an impact on that hundred percent for sure. There's there's and, and we do realize that. And like I said, we have dedicated programs to address a lot of that. If you look at our website, you will see the wildlife and roads project and wildlife and energy that I mentioned now, also the national business and biodiversity network, and all three of those really focus on human disturbance, uh, roads developments, etc. So um, yeah, and some of our partnerships there with ESCOM etc. have been going for about twenty four years, twenty six years now. So those are um, some of the examples of, of some of those programs. Um. Um, Eleanor, your question about um, our operating South Africa and other parts of Africa. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't show you a slide now because I'm not the host here, but effectively we've got um, every single province in South Africa, we've got at least one property. We operate in Kruger, around Kruger in private reserves like Bongani Mountain Lodge. We got Makalali, which is just west of Kruger, operate in uh, Pilansburg as well as Medikwe, um, Durban, Cape Town, Garden Route, um, Northern Cape, Bloemfontein, and Durban. So we've got a big footprint and nine properties um, that are hotels and 16 which are lodges across um, South Africa. And then we operate Chug Marina in Kasani, Botswana, and the David Livingston in Livingston, Zambia. And we've been around since about 2008. And then Colleen, your question, does our educated guests about participating in negative ecotourism activities such as walking with lions? So effectively our holding company, Turvest, has signed the pledge um, that no animal interaction, uh, walking with lions, etc., will be done um, we don't send any tourists from our inbound side to do any of those, any of those activities. And where possible, our rangers um, try and highlight the facts of positive ecotourism versus negative ecotourism. Yeah, Colleen, it's also very important, obviously, for EWT when we select our partners um, to partner with. You know, we, we have run extensive campaigns um, to stop uh, cup petting, etc., at, at these 
facilities. So we uh, chose very wisely and very carefully when, when we obviously partner as well. So, um, so from our side as well, we, we definitely encourage people to go into um, Wild and Free. You'll see our Wild and Free campaign, our hashtag Wild and Free campaign, where we really encourage tourists and guests to, you know, use facilities like Gray mentioned earlier, AHA, lodges like, you know, um, Billonsburg, uh, in Kruger, uh, Ivory Tree, Shepherd's Tree, in Kambeni, all these places to rather go and see predators out there wild and free than, you know, than, than petting them and, and seeing, them, seeing them in these enclosed areas. So, uh, so yeah, I hope that, that sort of answers your question. Um, Eleanor, on the, there's a hard focus on high-end rather than mass tourism, so the impact on wildlife is minimized. I think ahar has got a combination of uh, high-end, smaller type properties um, from 12 rooms, but we have also got big properties that um, we do game drives in, but again, or in game reserves. But again, there we don't do self-drives, so the like in, in Kambeni, which is a big property of 150 rooms in the Kruger, um, effectively, the guests must come on game drives with us, so we take where there would naturally be normal Kruger, people self-drive, two people in a car. We load eight to ten in there, so the impact into Kruger is less vehicles, because uh, you've got more people obviously on the game drive vehicle. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think our focus is, is, is both. I think the benefit with the bigger properties is you generate significantly more revenue for the park that you are there or the community. So we have community-based fees and national parks fees. So there is a combination in weighing it up. But again, our main thing is obviously um, responsible um, tourism as opposed to just mass. Um, Andrew, your question in regards to the Northern Berg Conservation Initiative with Alpine Heath and other landowners, um, I think that one we must take offline. Um, I will speak to Neil Renwick later today and see where we are exactly in terms of um, that project. But it is something we're certainly interested in from an AHA and tourist perspective. Yeah, and Andrew, just to add in there, um, obviously EWT has also got quite a few programs and um, uh, projects um, in, in that area. So we will try and also, um, you know, via the partnership, try and link up and, and see what what, what impact we can have in, in those kind of areas. So I hope that answers your question as well. All right, only a pleasure, Andrew. Thanks a lot. Um, if anybody's got any more questions, we'll give another minute or two to see if anybody else has got any, any questions that they would like to ask. Um, please, please send them through to, to both myself and Graham. We would gladly answer as many of them as we could. Right, we got a question here from um, Natalie Ace. Um, she's asking, are virtual tours the way forward? And what risk does it pose to poaching in protected areas? Right, so Natalie, I think we, we've seen with, with COVID, um, there's quite a lot of initiatives around these, these virtual tours and virtual safaris. So yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a difficult one. I assume only time will tell. Um, you know, I think for, for people like myself and, and others, you know, who are, who are really invested in these uh, in, in conservation and, and these protected areas i really like the real thing I, I like to be out there myself i think it's it's uh it's still for me it's still a, a real privilege and a and an opportunity to get out into the field and out into the bush so virtual you know tours from my point of view is not necessarily always always the way forward but i do believe that there is a lot of scope in it there is um as we saw now with COVID, i think there's quite a lot of this happening all over the place it it is great to I think you know if you if you put yourself in someone's position, maybe that's not not in South Africa that can't that don't have doesn't have access to these places um, as frequently as we do. Then I assume these kind of virtual safaris is one of the only ways to really to really experience a lot of the conservation initiatives and and see the wildlife. So I do believe that there is a lot of that happening and it and it will go. Um, and you you're asking what risk does it pose to poaching in protected areas? Um, I think if I, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking whether, you know, people see virtual tours or they see animals, um, you know, what risk does it pose? Once again, virtual tours is a very, very new thing. It's, it's not, so we haven't really seen major impacts around that. Um, once again, I think still too, too early to really tell. 
but yeah, I mean, uh, that is a that is a point and a very good question to 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 answer. So I'll also hand over to Graham just to um, tackle it from a tourism point of view. I mean, from our side, virtual tours are exceptional for awareness of your product and building your brand. Our concern is that you won't have people potentially going through your property, um, which obviously affects jobs and communities. So our focus is still to get people to the property. And yes, virtual tours can potentially drive additional people. And then from approaching, particularly in Rhinos, we don't, we try not to um, put on social media or get guests to put on social media pictures of rhinos in our private reserves. Um, obviously it just highlights effectively the density of endangered animals that you have on a property and it can pose some risks. All right, then we have a question from Carmela. Um, does EWT offer any volunteer programs currently? Um, Camilla, as it stands at the moment, we don't, but it is something that we're looking at uh, in future. So, um, yeah, just uh, please, if you, if you look for my details online, just, just drop me an email. I'll be able to, to guide you in the right direction. It's not something that we are you know, currently actively doing, but it is something that we will look at in future, most definitely. So we will keep you, um, keep you updated on that. Like I said, just drop me an email and I will uh, gladly guide you in the right direction. Then Colleen, another question from Colleen. Does AHA or EWT engage with local communities, providing education about the importance of protected areas and assist with alternative livelihoods other than directly hiring? If so, have you noticed a decrease in poaching in these areas? Gee, not, a, not an easy one, Colleen. Um, we have a, 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 a program in the EWT called People in Conservation, our PIC program. That program is dedicated to education in these areas around around protected areas, communities around protected areas. <clears throat> it also helps um, to educate, um, you know, farmers around areas that, that might have human wildlife conflict around these protected areas. So, yeah, there is initiatives currently. Um, unfortunately, COVID hit and we, we couldn't start any joint initiatives between EWT and AHA, but it is part once again i think in graham's presentation and in mine we showed the three pillars and which is our partnership where our strategies really align between ewt and aha and that's saving species saving habitats and benefiting people so i think that speaks to that so i'll hand over to graham for the rest yeah and then from our side from aha with local communities we've recently just started a, a local guiding school so where we have got properties across south africa we effectively take people youth and um to put them on a six month program to become rangers. So we've taken people from numerous, uh, numerous communities across the country and brought them up to be rangers. Um, in Makalali, as an example, we take kids once a week from a local community with one of the rangers, we provide them lunch and we go on a game drive and educate them about the importance of um, protected areas and conservation areas. And in Kambeni, um, in Bluli, Bongani Mountain Lodge, we do similar. So mainly focused on the youth to try and get them to be aware that firstly, tourism can be a, uh, a career, as well as um, the importance of protecting those conservation areas. Yeah, Colleen, just to, just to chat a little bit more about the, the rest of your question um, around, um, have we noticed a decrease in poaching in these areas? This is something that's very difficult to measure um, and often you know, involves a lot of other external factors other than just education and, um, you know, and, and employing people and, and providing alternative livelihoods in these areas. So, um, but yeah, we, we do try and monitor this in areas where we work in as part of our uh, monitoring and, and evaluation at EWT. So um, those kind of reports, if you look at our integrated reports annually, you'll see some of the results around that um, in, in the integrated report. So I hope that that sort of answers your question. All right, thanks Colleen. Um, if there's any last questions, we, we, we're happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, we, will, uh, we will try and uh, sign off with you guys. I mean, both Graham and myself available to, um, you guys can drop us an email or give us a call, or I see there's a lot of people that's really interested in the partnership and really want to support some of the AHA lodges, um, uh, which, which in turn will benefit the EWT as well, which is really great. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so yeah, if, if there's no other questions, okay, there's one more. Um, we will send through, yeah, thanks a lot. 
Um, and then Andrew says, thanks to our EWT for this partnership. It sounds really interesting and exciting. Looking forward to seeing the fruits of your work together. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks, James, for saying it's informative. Thanks and brilliant. And Sandra, can you just give us your email address right now? Okay, we'll try and type it. Okay, let me just try and type it quickly for you guys. That helps. Thanks, Camilla. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, we will try and do, once the partnership is up and going, we will try and do another webinar for you guys to chat a little bit more about some of the successes um, and some of the challenges of the partnership. So um, we were also really excited and really looking forward to a lot of that. So thank you very much. For any of you, um, please just look in the, in the question and answer box for our email addresses. If you want to do anything else um, or, or um, chat to us, please, please drop us an email. And thank you very much for tuning into this. We, we really appreciated everybody uh, joining us for this, for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much.